anyone can have a good idea. But the difference between those who have an idea and those who have a successful company is in the execution. These women figured out how they could transform a concept into a thriving company in New York City. And it all started with her big idea. Christina Mercando d'Avignon has always been interested in tech, but could not ignore her creative instincts. She took her entrepreneurial spirit and merged it with her interests to create wearable smart jewelry she calls Ringley. The concept was widely received and Ringley is sold in stores around the world. I'm Christina Mercando d'Avignon and I'm the founder and CEO of Ringley. Ringly is smart jewelry that connects to your phone and it will alert you to different notifications when you're getting calls, emails, texts, whatever you set it up for. I'm really interested in this idea of invisible technology, so making technology that doesn't actually feel like technology. It feels more just like a natural part of what you do and what you wear. And that informed the decision to start Ringley because I wanted it to look like something that I wear every day and that I would want even if it had no technology inside. And so miniaturization was something we focused very heavily on in the beginning, getting it really, really tiny so that it could essentially be invisible. That's what the ring looks like inside. This is the cushion cut. And before we had a radius on each of these corners. These dimensions is what we're playing with. Have they been finding a lot that are off? So there's a lot of variation between table widths. I think like some variation's fine. Yeah. I grew up in a small town in Westchester called Irvington, about 20 miles north of Manhattan. I started getting into tech at a very early age. It was partly the combination of the creative side and then more of the math and science side. And I think that comes from my parents. My mom was much more creative and my dad was much more analytical. I graduated from Carnegie Mellon with two degrees. One was fine art and the other was human computer interaction. So I always had an interest in merging the arts and technology. I worked in the music industry for a while after school and then I went to a startup which was called Hunch and it was a machine learning company. And that company was acquired by eBay and that's when I really wanted to get back into entrepreneurship. I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. When I had the idea for Ringley, it was just something that I wanted to exist in my life so badly. I decided to take a jewelry making class, I decided to take a circuit board class, and learned how to kind of get started. So now when I get a text message, it will vibrate twice and show purple. And we have all these different apps that we're connected to, so you can get anything from your Uber notifications to your Facebook. And then we also do activity tracking, so it tracks how many steps you took in a day, how many calories you burned. The ring box that it comes in is actually the charger, so you just drop it in there, and it takes about four hours to fully charge. When I started out, it was just me, and then I brought in other people that I had met along the way. We were really, really scrappy in the beginning. I was literally soldering our first circuit board together. And then we decided to join an accelerator program out in California, and it was hardware specific. So that program really kind of taught us how to build a hardware company and how to manufacture a product. So what are you looking at? Analyzing a power management circuit for any new rings and bracelets. Right now we have it on a bunch of different chips and this chip kind of does everything. That's a prototype of... Cool. The more and more I just talked to people in the network, the more I got really excited about wearable technology and where it was gonna go and what it could become. Wearable tech is kind of a new category that just came about in the past three years. For me, I had the idea because I started to see how our clothing and our accessories could become our devices and how they could help make us stronger and better and healthier and more efficient. And that's the part about it that really excites me. So I ended up raising a round of funding really before I had working, working prototypes. 
When we first launched the brand, we sold out of the first thousand in under 24 hours. And we got a lot of attention from the press and a lot of excitement around the idea and the concept and the brand. It helped us raise a new round of funding, which took us through mass production. Ringley is sold on ringley.com. We're in Bloomingdale's and Barnes and & Noble and Amazon and even Marcus and Shopbop, so that's been fun to see too. We've gone from rings to bracelets, and now we have a new line coming out, which is exciting. My advice to people starting out in tech would be to really have perseverance, but also believe in your idea, because you're gonna be with it for a really, really long time. And if you're not behind it 100% from the beginning, it's gonna be that much harder to keep going. And New York's great in the sense that you're close to a lot of brands and fashion and schools that have great fashion programs and design programs. I think for people starting out, there's a lot of opportunity here and there's a lot of ways to get exposure to a very, very big group of people. What it means for me to be an entrepreneur is taking a vision for the future and actually executing. I think it's really easy to have ideas, but it's way harder to go out and actually make it and, for me, ship something. I think anyone who's getting into entrepreneurship should realize that the idea is the easy, easy part. And you have to have a lot of grit and a lot of perseverance. For Ringley, I want to be the fashion brand of the future, where it's not just about creating things that people love aesthetically, but it's also about creating experiences and something that you connect with on a more personal level. Sisters Tish and Snooki Belomo always stood out when they were lounging in clubs during the height of the punk scene in New York City. The dynamic duo took their unique and colorful style and turned it into a brand that has lasted decades. Manic Panic still stands out in countries across the globe. I'm Snooki Belomo, and I'm the co-owner, co-founder of Manic Panic NYC. Manic Panic is a company, a brand that my sister and I started way back in 1977 in the early days of punk rock in the East Village that has become a global brand known for bright hair colors and cosmetics. We have a whole line of cosmetics, all kinds of lipsticks, nothing too natural. Eye eyelashes, pencils, pencils, powders, glosses, lots and lots of lashes. Working with my sister is great. It's sometimes difficult because we know each other so well and we sometimes get into kind of things. But in general, I think it works because we do have the same principles and morals, and so we don't have to argue about those things. Our products are sold all over the world. It's just amazing. It's gone from St. Mark's Place to just everywhere, Japan and Australia and Europe and UK and South America. It's unbelievable. It's our dream come true. This is Canada? Oh. This is Canada, yeah. That's Canada? Okay. And this is all for New Zealand. I love the fact that we're in New Zealand. Right? Yeah. Tish and I were both born in Manhattan, then we moved to Queens, and we always had sort of an entrepreneurial gene in us that we inherited from our father. Even though we didn't grow up with him, we got that <laughs> entrepreneurial spirit. I had graduated from NYU with a degree in English. That didn't get me very far. I didn't know how to type, so we were living in the Bronx with our mother, who raised us by herself, and we started going downtown to the clubs in the 70s, to Max's Kansas City, and later on to CBGB. And we just loved the club scene and the club life and taking the subway down from the Bronx, <laughs> last stop on the one train all the way downtown. We got a taste of showbiz and pizzazz and sparkle and downtown people. So we started singing in different bands. We got into a show at this theater called the Bowery Lane Theater, which was across from CBGB. It was a Palm Casino review, and a lot of our friends were in it, and they let us be in it too. We ended up 
in Blondie being her backup singers for a while. People always loved our look. We had a look that nobody else wore in hair, makeup, clothing. And people were always asking us where they could buy it. And we thought, well, let's open a store as a sideline to our singing career and see if we can sell our look and sell what we love. So we opened this little store on St. Mark's, and it was the first punk store in America. And we had no idea what we were doing. We had no business training. We just figured it out, and we're still figuring it out <laughs> as we go along. It was just amazing. The whole scene down there was so cool and was so inexpensive to rent. It was also a bit dangerous, but we really didn't care. We were trying to think of a name for our original store and our brand, and our mother was working in a mental hospital at the time. She was an art therapist. Her patients would go into manic panics, and she said, well, why'd you call it manic panic? And it was just the perfect name for our store, our brand. It's catchy, and it's her legacy. Gotta love the pink oh, and blue beard. It looks great. Good Those are all the beard. colors yeah. he used? Divine wine, plus it got pink, smoke screen. That's very cool the way they did that. So many of our products in the early days were inspired by the Bowery and the East Village and the punk scene, and also the glitter glam scene, which was pre-punk. And it was like sort of trashy rock and roll. That's what we based our brand on. We just opened and we're selling stuff we loved, stuff we made, stuff we found. Debbie Harry took us to this great shoe store all the way downtown on Reed Street and it had this basement full of stiletto shoes. So we bought up all their unused vintage stilettos and we were selling those and we just would sell whatever we loved. And one of the things we ended up specializing in was beauty products because nobody had beauty products like we liked. We had started going over to England and sometimes find these really cool old cosmetics from the 50s and 60s and these old pharmacies we'd go into drugstores and say, do you have any old cosmetics? And we found lipstick colors that you couldn't get anymore. And we started selling those. And then we found contract manufacturers to make makeup to our specifications, our name on them. And that was the launch of our cosmetics line. And we became known for those kind of cosmetics and the hair color, because no one else had it. And we filled this niche market that we didn't even know that's what we were doing, but <laughs> we learned later that that's what we did. Anytime a band came in from out of town, one of the bands that was about to play CBGB, they would come to Manic Panic and they would hang out there during the day and then everybody would go to CBGB's at night. We had all sorts of customers like Cher came in, all the Ramones, Dead Boys, the Eurythmics, I remember walking in. Paul Simon and Carrie Fisher came in together once. I was like, wow, that's a cute couple. Let's make her punk rock. She's a punk, punk, punk rocker, a punk rocker. I love working in New York City. It's the center of the universe as far as I'm concerned. It's just the coolest city in the world. It gives you such energy to be in New York City and such inspiration. It's like no other place on earth. We're expanding into the professional market more. We launched our line of hair color for professional stylists and we're working on add-on products, shampoos, conditioners. I think the elements of Manic Panic that are distinctly New York are Titian me. It's our spirit and it's the spirit of New York and it's really shaped who we are and what our business is. It's just amazing and we keep on going and we keep on growing. We're like New York City roaches. You can't get rid of us. You can't stomp us out. We keep coming back. Danielle Chang had an established career in publishing, fashion, and art. But when she became a mother, she decided it was time to dig deep into her own cultural roots and start her own business. That's when she created Lucky Rice, a food festival that celebrates Asian culture in cities across the country. I'm Danielle Chang, and I'm the founder of Lucky Rice. 
Lucky Rice is an Asian food festival that I started about eight years ago. And since then, we've grown into eight different national markets. We usually curate the festivals so that there's about 40 local participants in each market, and they create a walk around tasting where upwards of a thousand guests can come and try different Asian food. We were fortunate to have people like Morimoto and Eric Repair and Jean Georges von Gersten, all of these chefs you may not think of as Asian, but who actually cook a lot of Asian food and have inspired so many New Yorkers to experience Asian food through their dishes. Well, look at that. Oh my goodness. You know what? Let's feature this on our newsletter next month because I really love the idea how fusion food is being rebirthed and everybody loves using fusion for Asian food because it really is how we're eating today. I was born in Taiwan to Shanghainese parents and moved to New York for college. I went to Columbia for both grad and undergrad. I come from a really traditional Asian family. I kind of had three choices, law school, business school, or medical school. But when I talked to my dad about that as I was graduating from college, he just thought that none of those choices made any sense for me because clearly I had no passion invested in any of those career paths. But I was really interested in art. So I decided to pursue art history and then later a master's in critical theory. I was a professor of art history and a curator of contemporary art and a dealer. It was all really exhilarating, but then I realized that my entire life kind of consisted of one mile radius in downtown Manhattan. And I was only 25 and there was such a big world out there. I was headhunted to start up the U.S. division of a French media agency, Astroline. They're actually a beautiful custom publishing house and they wanted to start a American division for their creative custom agency arm. I was at Astroline for a little over a year when I found out that I got pregnant. And this job I had required going out every night and it was just way too fabulous to carry off with a nine month old stomach. So I decided to take a sabbatical to have my child. And then from then on decided that in order to really have the work-life balance that I strived for, I had to be my own boss. And then I started Lucky Rice. It was really meant to be, I hate the word lifestyle business because people don't think you take it seriously when you say a lifestyle business. But in fact, it was a product that I created for my career at that time of my life that just fit so well because it allowed me to be home with my child and to work at 4 a.m. or all through Sunday if I wanted. What are we doing for this week's newsletter? I think I read this article that said that people like looking at colorful foods because it makes them like happier. Oh. So. Huh, I guess that makes sense. Food equals happiness. I decided to call the company Lucky Rice because rice is the foundation of Asian food and Asians also all have a cultural affinity for luck auspiciousness. Everyone says success has a lot to do with being at the right place at the right time, and I think that that's definitely true of Lucky Rice. When I started the business, it was 2010, a time when I think the hunger for Asian food in America was just starting to really feed. And when I first had this idea to start an Asian food festival, I would go to all the other festivals just to make sure that my big idea wasn't already somebody else's big idea. <laughs> and I found that there was a really great opportunity. There were a lot of people that were interested in food and Asian food in particular. Lucky Rice is located in the heart of Chinatown in Manhattan on Canal Street. I really feel like I'm a New Yorker. It's hard for me to say I'm an Asian American or a Chinese American or I'm from Shanghai, but I'm just a New Yorker because I've spent the majority of my life in New York. I came here with a, if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere, Frank Sinatra attitude, and I'm still trying to do that. I think New York has a lot to offer people who want to start a business because there's such a vast collection of opinions here. In terms of the food world, you'll find financiers, restaurateurs, students, pastry chefs, mom and pop entrepreneurs who are learning how to start up a business for the first time. And I think that these diverse voices really play off of each other and enable people to create thriving businesses. The best piece of advice I've ever received is from my grandmother. 
She said that in order to succeed in life, you have to be part man and part woman. <laughs> As a longtime entrepreneur, I am so used to rejection. I have a very thick skin, and so it doesn't bother me when people say no. <laughs> and I think that that really is how I was able to kind of carry Lucky Rice through the years. After the festivals took off and Americans grew hungrier and hungrier for Asian food, we were able to expand into developing a content platform. So now we have our bi-weekly newsletters, our social media platform, a published cookbook, and a PBS series. I'm doing what I love, which is telling meaningful stories about my culture. Not sure what the future is going to bring. It's a constantly shifting evolution, and that's what's so exciting. Jessica Ravello was creating websites for blockbuster films when she recognized the opportunity growing in the gaming app business. So she and her husband launched Arcadium, which started with games and has since grown into an interactive content powerhouse that has users engaged on all of their tech devices. My name is Jessica Ravello and I am the co-founder and CEO of Arcadium. Arcadium is a tech company that creates interactive content designed to keep people on websites for as long as possible. We started 15 years ago by making games and taking things like the crossword that someone would find in their Sunday paper and digitizing it. And then as the company has evolved and digital publishers have evolved, we've started doing more things in article, polls and quizzes and interactive content to keep readers engaged. Arcadium works with 450 of the world's biggest digital publishers, and we actually are the developer of the Solitaire that comes pre-installed on every Windows 10 operating system sold around the world, as well as the Mahjong that's on that operating system and the Sudoku, so just things that are easy and fun, that are stress relievers for people. That's how we started the business. First item on the agenda, meetings this week. Rob and I just had an amazing meeting. I don't think it could have gone any better. We didn't have to ask for the business because it was just this like assumed yeah. thing at the end. He was like, what's the downside of doing it? And I was like, the only downside is not having done it already. <laughs> he was like, oh, I'm sure. That's why I said he started laughing. Please don't tell me you said that. No, I did. <laughs> When I graduated from college, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to be president of the United States and I wanted to work in the movie business. And I thought the movie business would be an easier route, so I ended up working in an independent film studio called Artisan Entertainment. And when I was 24 years old, I helped build a website for a movie called The Blair Witch Project, which went on to be the most successful independent film of all time. And that was really the first understanding I got I think of entrepreneurialism because when I was growing up, there weren't many female entrepreneurs to look up to and certainly kind of the myth of the tech entrepreneur hadn't been out there. Facebook hadn't started yet, Google hadn't started yet. I think that was the first time when I really realized that I could not only make a career out of this, but also build my own business from something like this. So from there I went on and I worked at an early dot com in 1999. That's where I met my co-founder, who's uh, now my husband. So yeah, this one, when I show it to people, people are absolutely floored. You should definitely use that one. Okay. And we said, hey, you know, we're young. This tech thing seems to be really taking off. We don't really love this company we're working for. Why don't we see if we can figure something out? Kenny came up with the name Arcadium. It was kind of a combination of arcade and stadium. So we started the company in 2001. This is before the iPhone, this is before apps. People were playing games for the first time really on their computers. And we said, content will always do well. So we said, what are the kinds of content that people want to do that we think we could do well and have an impact on? And that's fun. And so that's how we ended up creating our first games. We're located in Manhattan in the Flatiron District, and we also have an office in Russia. I think there's an authenticity about New York, and we are who we are. We're gonna do it our own way, and we're totally okay with that. But when we started the business, we couldn't afford to hire developers in the United States, so we started outsourcing. We actually found a company that was run by an American based in Ukraine. We had about six people, and then we eventually bought the company and grew it to 100. And things were humming along, things were great. We bought an apartment in Ukraine. I would take my children there in the summers. They were partially raised there. And then in 2014, the government started coming under a lot of protests. 
The Russians moved in and they essentially took the entire region. In December of 2014, the United States government sanctioned the region and made it illegal for any American companies to do business there. So we talked to all of our employees and of the 100 that we had, 50 said that they were willing to move. We opened an office in southern Russia with a skeleton crew of 50, and now we're up to 85 and doing great. When we started the business, it was one of those things where we didn't have titles, right, because there's two people in an apartment. When we started going on meetings and we needed titles, he said, well, I'm going to be the CEO. And I said, fine, I'm the chairman of the board then. For no real reason, right? And we kept those titles for the first 15 years that we were in business. When we kind of wanted to take the business to the next level, we decided to go after our first round of institutional investment. And when we did that, I was pregnant at the time. And I think that I witnessed firsthand what you hear from a lot of female entrepreneurs, which is that they felt kind of invisible in the room on those meetings. I was always the only female in the room. I was the pregnant female at that. All of the questions were always directed at my husband. I would ask a question, the answers would be directed at him. And that really affected me and it really hurt me. And we also knew that there were tons of women like me who were starting businesses or who were trying to change the ratio, especially in tech. And we wanted to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So we decided that we were gonna change titles and we did that two years ago. And it really has made a difference. I'm proud of that. I wanna pave the way for women of future generations to not be the needle in the haystack. This is our little winds wall in our kitchen at Arcadium. And the idea of this really started a couple of years ago when we realized that we were only celebrating really big events. And we weren't paying enough attention to the little stuff that was happening every day that was allowing those big things to take place. My advice for somebody who wants to start their own business would be save up your money. <laughs> it would be grow a thick skin. Definitely. Surround yourself with people who believe in you and who believe in your vision and know that you can do it. Find a great support system and don't give up. I don't really believe in balance. I believe in being fully present in the moment that I'm in. So I think it's funny if you look in my office, you won't see pictures of my kids, which I think is strange to people because I have three boys and they're my life. I love them more than anything. But when I'm here, I'm all about Arcadium. And when I'm home, I'm all about them. I think that the best entrepreneurs and the most successful people in general are people who are constantly challenging their own realities and people who are constantly trying to develop themselves and take themselves out of their comfort zone slightly. I do focus on trying to not only learn new things for the sake of my business, but to just improve myself as a leader and as a person. Each of these women had her own strong instincts and bravely set forward on her own personal journey to pursue those instincts. See how other women like them did it on their own on the next episode of Her Big Idea.